Proton pump inhibitors represent a class of drugs most prominently known for their use in acid-related GI disorders. The acid I'm referring to is the one in our stomach. Our stomachs contain hydrochloric acid that helps with food digestion, killing of pathogens, and aiding in absorption of certain minerals. The stomach produces about three liters of acid each day. That's more than half a gallon. This acid has a pH of about one to two, which is just about about two points above the most acidic substance like battery acid which has a pH of zero and battery acid is strong enough to dissolve metal and bone so you're probably wondering how in the world is our stomach able to withstand this HCL it must be some highly protective lining in the stomach yep and you are right so the stomach lining consists of four layers if this is the hydrochloric acid in the stomach, then the first layer that actually touches the hydrochloric acid is the mucosal layer. Then under that layer, we have the submucosal, then the muscularis, and lastly, the serosa. Let's learn more about each layer. So first, the mucosal. The role of the mucosal layer is to produce the hydrochloric acid and also protect against it. This is achieved with a combination of specialized cells in the mucosal, parietal cells, chief cells, G cells, ECL cells, D cells, and mucus cells. We will cover the functions of these cells in depth later and their mechanism. This layer is the most important in my opinion and will be the focus of this video and then we have the submucosa the submucosa is important for structural support and signaling it houses the meissner nerve plexus which is part of the enteric nervous system the enteric nervous system often called the brain in your guts is a vast network of neurons embedded within the walls of the digestive tract extending from the esophagus to the rectum the meissner's nerve senses local signals or triggers like presence of food or the stomach stretching in size or pH changes. And then it sends a neural input to the mucosa to increase or decrease acid production. Also, the submucosa is a dense connective tissue that supports the mucosa and anchors its glands and cells in place. Lastly, it contains blood vessels that deliver oxygen and nutrients to the mucosal layer and carries out waste. Next, we have the muscularis, and it is important for mixing and mechanical digestion. It contains smooth muscles that contracts to mix food with gastric juices. It then facilitates movement of food through the GI tract. This is known as peristalsis. At the junction between the stomach and the duodenum, we have the pyloric sphincter. This is a muscular valve that's formed by the thickened circular layer of the muscularis. The muscularis contracts or relaxes the pyloric sphincter to control the rate of gastric emptying. It only allows small amounts of the digested food to enter their duodenum at a time. It contains the hour back plexus where the message is processed and it leads to muscle contraction or relaxation. Lastly is the serosa, which is the protective outer covering. Its main function is to protect the stomach and reduce friction with surrounding organs. It doesn't play much of a role in acid secretion. Now let's go back to the mucosal layer and learn more about it. So let's assume this is the lumen of the stomach, so the empty space, and then here is the mucosal layer, and then the cells that are in that layer. This may not be the best picture demonstrating this, but please just try to visualize and follow along. So first, we will go through each cell and its function. Mucosal cells. That will be the red cell here. We will call it MC. These cells secrete a viscous sticky layer made of mucin, which is a gel forming glycoprotein. This layer is rich in bicarbonate ions, which neutralizes the acid. The mucus is a protective gel-like barrier that lines the inner surface of the stomach, shielding it from its own acidic and enzymatic contents. Next are the parietal cells. That is the orange and it's identified as PC. Your main job is to secrete the hydrochloric acid. These cells have hydrogen potassium ATPase pump, also known as proton pumps, on the apical membrane that pumps hydrogen ions into the stomach lumen in exchange for potassium into the cell. And then the potassium and chloride are moved into the lumen. This creates HCL. 
The parietal cells are stimulated by histamine, gastrin, and acetylcholine to produce acid and inhibited by somatostatin, prostaglandins, and low pH. For all this to make sense, we need to learn about the other cells in the mucosal layer and the hormones they produce. So we will come back to the parietal cells, but next, chief cells. These cells secrete pepsinogen, an inactive enzyme that gets converted to pepsin when combined with the hydrochloric acid. Pepsin helps digest proteins. The chief cells are stimulated in the presence of an acidic pH, gastrin, and vagal stimulation by acetylcholine. The vagus nerve is part of the parasympathetic nervous system that controls many functions in the digestive system. Next, we have the G cells, which secretes the hormone gastrin into the bloodstream, where it travels to the parietal cells to stimulate it to produce hydrochloric acid, and then the enterochromaffin-like cells to stimulate histamine release. They secrete histamine, which goes to the parietal cells and activate the histamine receptors. This leads to an increased production of hydrochloric acid by the parietal cells. Lastly, we have the D cells. The D cells secrete somatostatin, which plays the role as the inhibitory hormone. So we've talked about several cells that secrete hormones that stimulate the parietal cells, leading to an increase in the hydrochloric acid production. So the body is all about balance. So now we have somatostatin to counter that. It does this by inhibiting the G cells, leading to a decrease in gastrin production. The enterochromaffin-like cells, which will lead to a decrease in histamine production, and finally, they inhibit the parietal cells, which will directly lead to a decrease in hydrochloric acid production. The D cells secrete somatostatin when the pH gets too low or too acidic. So back to the parietal cells. Now you understand when I say histamine, gastrin, and acetylcholine stimulates it to produce hydrochloric acid. And somatostatin, prostaglandins, and low pH inhibits it. Prostaglandins are lipid compounds that have several physiological functions, one being promoting the secretion of mucus and bicarb, which is meant to enhance the mucosal protection. So now we have a good knowledge on the different factors that go into stomach acid regulation and protection of the stomach lining. When there is a disruption in this, that's how we get the acid-related GI disorders. First, we have gastroesophageal reflux disease, also known as GERD. So unlike the stomach, where its lining is well protected from the hydrochloric acid, other areas in the GI tract are not equipped to withstand the hydrochloric acid. Good example is the esophagus, which leads into the stomach. To protect the esophagus from the acid, there is the lower esophageal sphincter. This acts as a barrier to prevent the acid from refluxing into the esophagus. In patients with GERD, the lower esophageal sphincter is not functioning properly because it's too weak, it relaxes inappropriately, or it's overwhelmed by high gastric pressure. This unfortunately leads to acid moving into the esophagus, damaging the epithelium, causing heartburn and esophagitis. Next, we have peptic ulcer disease, and it is characterized by mucosal defects, ulcers in the stomach or proximal duodenum, which is the front part of the duodenum. It is mainly caused by H. pylori infection and chronic use of NSAIDs. H. pylori it occurs when a patient is infected with H. pylori. The H. pylori bacteria is able to survive in the stomach acid environment thanks to an enzyme known as urease. Urease breaks down the urea from the gastric juices and this gets converted into ammonia, which would then neutralize the gastric acid locally. This creates a more hospitable microenvironment for the bacteria. The infection itself causes damage to the gastric epithelial cells, plus the immune response to this leads to further inflammation, causing gastric duodenal ulcers. Second cause of peptic ulcer disease is with NC. So the gastric mucosa is protected by a mucus bicarbonated layer that neutralizes acid at the surface. There are also signaling molecules known as prostaglandins, 
which stimulate mucus and bicarbonate secretion. It maintains mucosal blood flow and promotes epithelial repair. NSAIDs inhibit the COX enzymes, which are important for the production of the prostaglandins. So this inhibition causes a decrease in the prostaglandins, leading to a decrease in mucus, decrease in bicarbonate, and decreased mucosal blood flow and impaired healing. Next, we have Zollinger Ellison syndrome, which is a condition caused by a gastrin secreting tumor known as a gastrinoma. It's usually found in the pancreas or the duodenum. This leads to excessive gastric acid production, causing recurrent and severe peptic ulcers, aka stomach ulcers. Lastly, we have stress ulcers. Stress ulcers are acute erosions or ulcers that form in the stomach or proximal duodenum. It usually occurs in critically ill patients. In patients with severe illnesses, there is a decrease in blood flow to the GI mucosa, leading to ischemia and mucosal injury. So PPIs are FDA indicated for all of these, including for functional dyspepsia, GI bleeds, and Barrett's esophagus. Functional dyspepsia occurs when there is no structural abnormality related to the pathophysiology, but the symptoms are acid-related. PPIs are used in this case, and also Barrett's esophagus is commonly caused by GERD, and it's a condition where the normal tissue lining the esophagus changes to tissue that resembles the lining of the intestine. This increases your risk of esophageal cancer. The reason why PPIs are effective against all these conditions is by irreversibly inhibiting the proton pump, which is found in the parietal cells of the stomach lining. This enzyme is responsible for the final step in the secretion of gastric acid into the stomach. PPIs are prodrugs, meaning they are inactive in the original form. When taken by mouth, they get absorbed at the small intestine and enter systemic circulation. PPIs are lipophilic, wheat bases, and accumulate in the parietal cells. In this acidic environment, they get converted to the active form. The active form of the PPI binds covalently via disulfide bonds to the proton pump. This irreversibly inhibits the enzyme, blocking acid secretion. Even though the plasma half-life is short, one to two hours, acid suppression lasts up to 24 to 48 hours because the pump is irreversibly inactivated. New pumps must be synthesized for acid secretion to resume. Examples of PPIs on the market are listed here for your information. Although these agents are incredibly effective at decreasing gastric acid secretion, they come with some side effects. This includes headaches, nausea, diarrhea, and constipation. The GI side effects are obviously due to the decrease in the stomach acid leading to changes in the GI motility. B12 deficiency because gastric acid is needed to release B12 from food. So if there is a decrease in the acid, then there will be a decrease in the absorption. You can supplement with B12 if needed. Hypomagnesemia, this is due to a reduced absorption in the intestines. Iron deficiency because acid is needed to reduce ferric iron to ferrous iron for absorption. Consider iron supplementation for patients. There is also an increased risk of hip, wrist, and spine fractures because of the decrease in calcium absorption due to low acid. This leads to impaired bone mineralization. Chronic PPI users should consider calcium and vitamin D supplementation. There's also an increased risk of enteric infections like C. difficile due to the decrease decreased acid barrier, which allows the pathogen to survive in the GI tract. And lastly, pneumonia. This is because of the decreased acidity leading to oral and upper GI bacteria like streptococcus to survive and colonize the stomach. In older patients that are critically ill, microaspiration of gastric or oropharyngeal secretions into the lungs can occur leading to aspiration pneumonia or even community-acquired pneumonia. Finally, before I bring the video to an end, let's learn about some clinical pearls about the PPIs. Timing is everything when it comes to the PPIs. They must be taken 30 to 60 minutes before the first meal of the day because after a meal is when the proton pumps are most active, so you want the drug in your bloodstream ready. Next, PPIs are not for immediate relief. 
PPIs take several days for full effect. For acute symptom relief, use antacids or H2 blockers in the interim. Next, abrupt discontinuation must be avoided because it can lead to rebound acid hypersecretion because when PPIs are used and it decreases the stomach acid, the body responds by increasing gastrin production, which will sensitize and amplify acid production. So once the PPIs are stopped, there's nothing to counter the surge in the acid production. This is why it must be tapered. So you could start with BID for about two to four weeks and then daily for about two to four weeks and then every other day for two to four weeks and then you stop it. PPIs have some significant drug interactions. So PPIs like omeprazole and esomeprazole inhibit the CYP2C19, which is needed to activate clopidogrel. This decreases the amount of clopidogrel that is activated, leading to a decrease in antiplatelet effects and potentially increasing the risk of cardiovascular diseases. To avoid this, PPIs like pantoprazole or ribeprazole are preferred. PPIs raise the gastric pH, which reduces the absorption of acid-dependent drugs. Some examples include amiodarone, posaconazole, atazanavir, and the satinib. Depending on the medication, it may be administered about two to three hours before the PPI. In terms of renal hepatic dose adjustments, there are no renal dosing adjustments for the PPIs, but in patients with moderate to severe liver disease, you want to be cautious of using agents like esomeprazole, omeprazole, and lansoprazole. The oral is preferred over the IV. The only time you really see IV being used is when the oral is not feasible. Like in patients with GI bleed, you may see pantoprazole 80 milligrams IV being used. And that will be all for today. Hopefully now you have a better understanding of the PPIs. Make sure to like, subscribe, and leave a comment down below. Thank you for watching this video and take care.